Let's pray and then we'll open God's word. Father, it is our heart's desire, the Lord, that as your word goes forth, it would find a place in our hearts. My prayer is that you would keep me from error, Lord, and keep me on track. Holy Spirit, just use my mouth right now to speak to every person in this room is my prayer. May ears be open and may hearts be open in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're turning to 1 Peter chapter 4, we probably have, we likely have maybe, I'm not sure how much time the Holy Spirit wants to spend on suffering as a Christian. Most people in the room are going, you can do that in just half a sermon, Pastor, that's okay, get that one out and done. But uh, that starts next week and I think it will at least be a two-part thing. So we're looking at maybe another three Sundays in 1 Peter and then we're finished and there's some here that said I thought it would never end, but it will end in a few Sundays. So as we come to chapter 4 today, um, I want to help us answer two questions. Uh, the first question I think most most believers could answer, and I actually think most churches could answer. And the second one, I'm not so sure that we're good at answering. And the first one is, what is a disciple? It's an interesting question. The second one is, how do we make disciples? Most people can answer the first question. You will actually find in most church circles, everybody's clambering to answer the second one. Nine out of ten churches in America, when they were surveyed and asked this question, couldn't give a definitive answer. And I think it would be the same for most churches in Australia. And to our detriment, it's most likely the same for us. But I, I actually want to have a look and unpack this because I've been praying about this for some time. If we want to know what a disciple is, we can, we can walk our way through Scripture and we will find some really good examples. The, the Greek word for disciple is a disciplined follower of Christ. A disciplined follower of Christ. But how do we as churches, because Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. That's what Jesus said. We're part of the A2A movement and the A2A movement uh, under its current leadership, which has my full support, is that we are a movement that makes disciples, that makes disciples, that makes disciples. But we need to answer the question. Uh, each church will answer this differently. But for us, we need to begin to answer this question. How is it that we make Disciples. When I have a look at disciples in the Bible, we might coin a few phrases maybe from the book of Acts, but you will find that once you get to chapter 20 in the book of Acts, the word disciple drops out of the Bible. It's not mentioned after that. And when I was clambering trying to find the best example for a disciple, it was given to us in the, in the Gospels. Twelve men gave us the greatest example of what it is to be a disciplined follower of the person of Jesus Christ. My favourite Gospel is the Gospel of John. And very, very challenging words come to us in the Gospel of John in chapter 6. It says at the beginning of the chapter, this is how, if Jesus was a pastor, man, he'd have got the sack because his congregation went from hundreds to 12, boom, in one conversation. But he had hundreds of followers. Many people, it says, were following Jesus. And then he had a teaching which said, you know what? If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. But of course, he was speaking about the fact that we need to rely fully on his sacrifice as a relationship with God. And many people said what many people say today. This is a hard teaching. So I can no longer walk with Christ. And it says that many from that point no longer walked with Christ. I find the same today. They, this is, this, we're going to have to chew this a little bit before we digest it. There are many people today that get to hard teachings about the person of Jesus Christ and say, you know what? I no longer want to follow Jesus Christ. It's okay while well, it's easy. I need to be absolutely 100% clear. Twelve men answered the question right when uh, Jesus turned around to the disciples and said, what about you guys? Do you want to leave as well? <laughs> Peter, speaking on behalf of all of them, said, uh, where do you think we're going to go? That's my paraphrase. Where do you think we're going to go, Jesus? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to know that you are the Son of God, says Peter. If you were told when you come to Jesus that life is going to be rosy from this point on and all your problems are going to go away and all your troubles are going to vanish, you need a refund. Not even Jesus made those claims. Jesus never put in the fine print, it will cost you everything to follow me. It's the irony of the gospel, I love it. It's absolutely 100% free, but it will cost you everything to follow Christ and nothing less. 
as we come to this, uh, this passage in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, I, as I was praying about this, I came to the understanding is, you know what, you can have the greatest seed, or the greatest seed with all the fullest potential, you can have the greatest soil, Chip Ingram gives this example as well, you can have the greatest seed and you can have the greatest soil, but if the environment is not right, neither of them will do any good. You can take a mango seed right now and plant it in Tasmania's best soil. I'll give you a guarantee, you'll never grow mangoes. Not unless you put up a hot house and whatever else. And so what is the environment that grows disciples? I think the environment is the key thing to growing disciples. I'm going to give you a hint, we're going to get to it later on. The Moravians got it right and the Wesleyans got it right. And therefore, we had one of the greatest awakenings that the globe has seen for a long time. We're going to touch on that in a moment. You know, as we come through this passage, uh, we, by the time we get to verse 7, Peter says that the end of all things is at hand. <laughs> it kind of reshapes how you do things. I can remember when I was uh, playing country football in Tasmania. I used to love playing football. Uh, and I was playing for one team and then I had an argument with the, with the coach and I left and I went to another team. And I never even looked at the calendar, but it just so turned out that the first game for my new team was against my old team. Man, I was glad when the final siren went. And I wasn't happy when the first one went. But as the game went on, we got to half time and we were behind and then by three quarter time, we'd clawed our way back. And by about halfway through the last quarter, where the scores were level. Got to about the last five minutes and everybody on the new team's going, you know what, I think we can beat these guys. The other guys were normally a better team than the team I came from. But you know what, all the water boys ran out after one of the goals was kicked and there was about four of them. And I say water boys, but they're about 60 years of age. And these guys came out and told us all, they had a pressing message for us all. There's five minutes left and you guys can win this. And do you know, when they brought that message out onto the field, it changed everything that we did in the next five minutes. Everything before that didn't matter. The next five minutes was all that mattered. All of a sudden, we had an urgency. All of a sudden, we had an imminence. All of a sudden, all that mattered was what we were going to do in the next five minutes. It changed our priorities. It changed our behaviour. I see this in AFL games all the time. If you, if you put some of the best AFL teams side by side on paper, you'll soon realise that when it comes to skill level, they're all about the same. So how do we define a winner in this? It's whoever's hungry on the day, you know? It's kind of, there's a difference. These guys are all skillful. Anyway, we won the game and I ran off the field of the change rooms very, very quickly. But I learnt something that day. I learnt that sometimes an imminence and an urgency changes your behaviour. Peter's writing to to suffering Christians. Peter's writing right now when Nero's beginning to short circuit. He can see the wires are starting to shake loose in Nero. And he says, you guys, the end of all things is at hand and it needs to change the way that you behave. I want to help us begin by answering the first question. What is a disciple? What does it look like to be committed? I think Peter gives us a really good example. I want to ask a question here because I've seen this over many times and I've I've even experienced this in my own personal life where I've seen some really great people that have been in leadership in churches and, and you can see the gifting and the grace of God on them but they continue to hit like a spiritual ceiling and it's not long before you realise there's something in the closet I want to ask everybody here today, if I could, can I tell you that the power of sin will be broken in any person's life, but absolutely by the power of the Holy Spirit. You won't manufacture it. But I want to tell you, if you are sitting here struggling today with any kind of power of sin, and you're wondering, what could I do as step number one to break that? I want to give you that answer today. It's an answer that the Moravians and the Wesleyans found, and it absolutely broke the power of sin in many people's lives. We start off in verse 1, it says, Since therefore, and Peter is referring back to verse 18, he says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. Can I tell you that Christ suffered in many ways? Yes, he suffered emotionally. Yes, he suffered separation from God in our place, but he absolutely suffered in the flesh. 
Seeing how Christ suffered in the flesh. The, uh, Christ had an attitude. We read in the Gospels. I'm amazed when I read in the Gospels that Jesus set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem, knowing exactly what waited for him when he got there. He had the purpose, I'm going to, to Jerusalem and nothing and nobody is going to take me off course between here and there. He set his face like flint. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, Peter asks us now to do something. He goes on and says, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. And uh, what Peter is saying here is for those that have decided, for those that have resolved, no matter what the consequences, I'm going to obey God. That's arming yourself with the same thinking that Christ had. The word arm here is exactly how we would anticipate it within a military term. It is to take up the weapons that have been given to us and that weapon is to arm ourselves with the same attitude and the same thinking of Christ because he goes on to say, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Whoever has resolved, I don't care what you've done to me. I don't care what's happened to me. I am resolved to obey Christ. And we're talking about Christians that would go on missionary journeys and come back to find their houses either looted or burnt to the ground. And that was done a lot at the hands of the Jews. And what Peter is saying is moving forward is going to take a commitment that from this point onwards, no matter what the cost, you're going to move forward. That sounds a lot like a disciple to me. That sounds a lot like 12 men that followed Jesus. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking for whoever has suffered, whoever has actually suffered in the flesh and decided that it is far more glorious to keep pressing on and serving Christ than receding back. Whoever has gotten to that point has done something. They have ceased from sin. Does this mean that they will be perfect from this point onwards? No, that's not what this means. But it means you have made a decision to put the old life behind you and that you're going to follow Christ. I want to give you an example. Everybody knows the account of the temptation of Jesus. Jesus is baptised and then says, interestingly enough, he was taken by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness. He was there to be tempted and that's not a word that's used loosely or lightly. Jesus actually suffered temptation. And so often we think, well, Jesus answered with with word and all we've got to do is build up our bank of memory verses. And I'm not against building up a bank of memory verses, but Jesus wasn't just reeling off scripture. What Jesus was saying was, uh, take this bread. No, what Jesus was saying was, uh, the word of God says this, and I am committed that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's not just reeling off memory verses. He's actually declaring his position and his commitment. You will not put the Lord my God to the test. Yet again, a commitment. If you want to get into a memory verse fight, let me give you a heads up. The enemy knows the scriptures better than anybody in this room. Let me give you another heads up. The Pharisees had huge, great big phylacteries, which were a record of all the scriptures that they could recite to you from memory. Yet all the scripture that they could peel off, they lived yet so distant from God. We should absolutely commit scripture to memory. That's absolutely something that we should do. But we should also take that scripture because it's not about what you can speak. It's about the scripture that you can live. It's about what's inside of here. Whoever's got that resolve, they've ceased from sin. Let me tell you where the power of sin lies. The power of sin lies in secret. Sin loses its power when you bring it out into the light. We're going to unpack this more as we go along. But the Moravians and the Wesleys got something right. They realised that the greatest environment for people to flourish and grow was an environment where people were honest, real and authentic. 
I was just, just this week, I was listening to the testimony of a, of a pastor in America that said that a leader came to his church. He was a leader in another church, great guy, but just one of these guys that kept hitting the spiritual ceilings uh, and he struggled with something in his life for a long time. And for some 32 years, it turned out, he had suffered with a secret addiction to pornography, something that was birthed in him from images that he had seen when he was seven or eight. And he was too ashamed to tell anybody else. He was too ashamed to tell his life group leader. He was too ashamed to tell anybody. But his testimony is this. I finally found a group an hour away from church where I could bring all of that out on the table. And for the first time in 32 years, it lost its power over me and I never looked at it again. If we want to experience true freedom, we've got to open the closets. That's not telling everybody our deepest, darkest secrets. It's about being real. It's not about coming before God with rehearsed prayers, making sure that we say all the right things and we've got these petite little prayers. Read the Psalms. They're far from petite little prayers. There are times in the Psalms when David is beating the floor. There are times when he's praising and there are times when he is saying, create in me a clean heart, O God. The Christian life is not about being perfect. An environment that facilitates growth is not about being perfect, it's about being real. I take great encouragement when I think about that and when I was praying about that because I actually believe that this is one church where people can be real. It's actually a safe place to be real here. We'll look at this more as we go along. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking, says Peter, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the human passions, but, there's the contrast, I love this but too, Terry, but for the will of God. But for the will of God. The will of God is always in direct contrast to our human passions. All too often the word obedience is a dirty word in churches. Do you mean I have to obey Jesus? Doesn't he just meet all my needs and everything's rosy? Yeah, he can do that too. Sometimes it means that we have to pound the pavement. Sometimes it means that we have to do things perhaps that we don't want to mean. Perhaps obedience looks like, I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what my family members say about me. I don't care how crazy they think I am. I wonder what's crazier, believing that a God created everything around us or is it crazy that everything came from nothing? I'm not sure who the crazy one is. Atheists hold just as much faith. You need faith to believe there is no God. You need strong faith to hold the fact that there is no God. But for the will of God. Let's keep reading down. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Peter is saying, you know what? You've had your time in the sun, champ. Give it up. (laughs) The time has passed. Let's get on with what we're really here for. In that football game, the time has passed for dilly-dallying around. We've got five minutes here, and that's what Peter's saying to these guys. The time has passed for, for suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to these, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. And I love that word flood. That's a great description. I don't know about anybody else in this room, but is there anybody else that feels like 50 years ago, somebody stuck their finger in the damn wall of sin and all of a sudden we're experiencing the gush of when the damn wall broke? (laughs) There are times when I look around us right now when I think, you know what, we're experiencing an unusual flood of debauchery. (laughs) Then I look at history over the last 2,000 years and I go, no, we're not. There's nothing new under the sun. Back in Peter's time, Emperor Nero castrated one of his servants so he could marry him. Just a different level of craziness now, that's all. Just a different level of craziness. But, says Peter, in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you, but they will give an account to him. My job as pastor, is to help everybody in this room die well. And what I mean by that is, I pray 
that I help everybody in this room to some degree prepare themselves to stand before the Creator. Because it's not just non-believers that give an account for the life that they have. We will all give an account. And that word give an account is we will actually have to answer with our mouths. I don't know what I'm going to say. I can't imagine that standing before his magnificence that I'll have anything important to say at all. But Peter's saying, you think these guys are living it up and they're going to get away with it? Every man stands before God. Emperor Nero will stand before God. Julius Caesar will stand before God. Billy Graham will stand before God. Adolf Hitler will stand before God. I have to stand before God and give an account for the life that I have lived. It speaks about giving an account to an authority. You know how we have to give an account to, sometimes to government authorities and to, and to police? It's the same thing here, except it's in the terms of God. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. What Peter is saying is he's ready to judge living and dead. Uh, you think that you can die without experiencing the judgment of God and you've got away with it? Peter says, no, no, no. No, he's ready to judge every single Then, of course, Peter comes down. If we jump down to verse 7, he says, The end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand, and it should change our priorities. I, I remember listening to a, uh, a, an American preacher for an hour and 20 minutes talk about a vision he had of heaven one time. I was very young in the Lord at this time, and by the time he got to the hour and 20 minutes, I thought, well, you know what, you could have given us the last minute and a half, and that's all we needed. But he goes through all the stuff that he believes he saw and he, took, he spoke like he was just going down the milk bar for a carton of milk. So I'm not sure how much of it I took away, but I did take away the last message. He says that he saw a lot of things and then he says he's coming to the point where he sees Christ. And he says, I'm expecting some really profound revelation like uh, maybe Jesus will explain the Trinity to me or maybe Jesus was, <laughs> and he said, Jesus says, go back and tell my people I'm coming again. You know, we can fight about the book of Revelations until we're black and blue in the face, but if we're going to do that, can we do one thing? Can we take one message from the... If you take nothing else out of the book of Revelations, take this one thing. Jesus is coming back. And I feel at times that if I fully grasp that, it would change the way I live right now. The end of all things is at hand, which means that what Peter's basically saying is, he says, if we're observing the redemptive plan of God, if we look at the history of Israel, if we look at the fact that all the history of Israel leads up to the Messiah coming, uh, the Messiah has come, uh, sin is now abolished, sacrifice has been made, he's looking at the redemptive plan, and he says, all that's left to do now is for Jesus to peel back the clouds. All that's, just like that siren on the football field, that's all that's left now. The end of all things is at hand, therefore it should cause us to be, says Peter, both self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And what he's saying here is that we should be self-controlled. Being self-controlled here in the Greek speaks about having a sound mind and evaluating and looking at all situations maturely. What does that mean? Let's not... Let's not fly off the handle before we get all the information. Living our lives with self-control means let's, let's have a look at everything. Let's lift the lid. You know, sometimes you walk outside and you can smell an odour coming from the bin and you, your mind starts reeling, what on earth is in the bin? And showing some self-control looks like just lifting the lid and having a look. Oh, it's not so bad. <laughs> it's just the tea I cooked. I heard those laughs. Self-control speaks of being logical and reasonable. Sober-minded allows us to uh, not allow mental intoxication. And it's very easy to become mentally intoxicated. That's what sober-minded means. <laughs> Just relax your mind for any period of time and you'll get enough information from the world that will intoxicate the way you think and the way you perceive the world. So be self-controlled. Be sober-minded. 
for the sake of your prayers. And what, what Peter means there is so as to be able to pray with greater clarity and understanding as well as effectiveness. But here's the big one. Now we're moving towards an environment that means we all grow. Who wants to grow in Christ? Amen? I do. I know I need to. Above all, and don't we keep bumping this one for those that have read ahead. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Every single book in the New Testament urges us to love one another, to let love be genuine, for brotherly affection to grow. I think the Bible might be trying to tell us something. I think Peter might be trying to tell us something. This is the second time he said it. When we love somebody earnestly, what does that mean? It means that we are zealous and we go out of our way to find ways to be loving towards someone. And I know most of us are saying, well, it'd be a whole lot easier to love them if they were a little bit nicer, Pastor. And I'd love them if they, if I could just, I'd love them, but I don't really like them. Do you know Jesus hasn't called anybody to like anybody? You don't have to, you don't have to like anybody if you don't want to. Because loving somebody's got nothing to do with how you feel and it's got everything to do with how you act. And sometimes love is a sacrifice. Sometimes it's a sacrifice to set ourselves aside and love somebody else. But here's the big one. Peter goes on and says something else. Since love covers a multitude of sins. Oh, what does that mean? We can sweep all our sins under the carpet? That's not what it means at all. If you read the translation of a uh, multitude uh, of sins, it speaks about covering up a multitude of offences. You know where there's more love in the room? We get offended a whole lot more difficultly. We tend to react a little bit differently when there's more love in the room. The fact that somebody's sitting in your seat this morning is a little bit less offensive when there's more love in the room. It covers a multitude of of offences. Things just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's the kind of environment where people can be real. Let us go on. Peter's got more to say. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling as each one has received a gift. Do you know every person in this room has got a spiritual gift? And can I be really, really selfish and say I want to see it? I'm going to unpack what I mean by that. This isn't all about one person standing up here speaking, praise God. It's not all about half a dozen people playing music. This authentic community is about the gifts that every single person has got. And every person in this room has got a gift. God has gifted you in a unique way that nobody else could be gifted. So we need you. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Uh, You know, uh, I'm rather selfish about this, but the more people that come here on a Sunday, the more of God's grace I get. Because the more of you wonderful people that are here, the more uh, God's meeting you gracefully in your mess, and I get the recipient. I, I get to be the recipient of that grace. That's what, that's what Peter's talking about here. It's when we all come together, God's grace freely flows among us. It's, when I was in Tasmania, we have a series of lakes. In fact, in one section of Tasmania, we have 3,000 lakes you can choose from to fish in. Some of them are as big as a swimming pool and some of them you wouldn't fish in a day. But then we have another series of man-made lakes that have been dammed and they're all there but as part of the hydroelectric scheme. And there's about 12 of them in particular that are all interconnected by pipes and channels. And it's enormously frustrating because uh, trout sook when the water level drops and the hydro will start draining a lake whenever they feel like it. Except for one, they, they manage to negotiate one. But what they do is when when one lake gets drained to a certain point, they start emptying all the other lakes to fill up this one that's been drained or or maybe this one's been depleted or, or whatever's happened. And that's what happens to us when we come here. That's what happens in an authentic community. What happens is we're all linked and when you're low on grace, the pipes start flowing. But we've got to lift the gates. We've got to lift the gates and let the channels flow. Yeah, the fact of the matter is we could, this week I could start up another six life groups. I could start up another six life groups 
and I could start, I, I could find leaders in this place. There's plenty of people in this place I could put my finger on now that are leaders. I could, I could start that up right now. I can go away from here. I've got to tell you, I can go away from here and I can, uh, I, I can read all the right books and we can get all the right speakers and we can get all the right music and all of that. And can I tell you that we'll have a, we'll have a grand old time and we could even fill this place. I've seen it. We could fill this place to 5,000 people. And do you know what? God probably wouldn't even have to show up. Or the difference is life groups aren't the answer. The answer is a community of people that decide, I'm done with sin. I'm done with the ways of the world. I want to do whatever I have to do to follow Christ. Then you can't keep people out of life groups. The Moravians got this. The Wesleyans got this. There was no structure around it. You know, we've got, we've got too many pastors that are CEOs today. John Piper wrote a book that wrecked me. I've got to go read it again. It's called Brothers, We're Not Professionals. We need less CEOs behind the pulpit and we need more pastors. And the reason for that is we're not building organisations. Jesus will build his church. And do you know that in the book of Acts, they just got on with doing what they knew they had to do. That's the greatest example of the community. It describes an authentic community. They met together in each other's houses. They shared food. You want to do church like they did in the book of Acts? Who wants to do church like they did in the book of Acts? Yeah, me too. They started at seven in the morning. And then uh, after they got through about the sixth or seventh preacher for the day, they would have tea and retire home at about seven. We read, uh, we read phrases in the book of Acts like they were of one accord, which speaks about the fact that they all have everything in common, but they're tuned like pianos, you know, all playing the same music, but tuned to an outward standard. And the Moravians and the Wesleys got it, and they got it to the point where we had groups of three or four people that just put their hand up and said, let's get together. And these, these people would get together and they would discuss what God had been showing them in the Word, and they would, they would pray for each other. And here's the big one. Here's the big one that the Wesleyans pressed. Confess your sins to one another. Get it out on the open. Don't be afraid to put your hand up and say, you know what, I've been struggling with this. i just got to let you guys know I, I've been struggling with this. And I need you to pray for me. It's in that community. The first community. Can I tell you, there was a, on any given Sunday, we have 110, 120 people here. There was 120 people that started the first church. And by the time we get to the book of Colossians, they had turned the known world upside down, including the Roman Empire. Paul took the message to Rome, knowing it would kill him. He said, I'm appealing to Caesar. Why? Because I'm taking the gospel to Caesar. And he dies under Nero. He's beheaded under Nero. But we see that there was a difference in the attitudes. Church, what we do here as a structure, life groups, all of that is just, is just the container what happens here on a Sunday is just the container for what should be happening on an everyday basis where we drop our garden and we just say, look, why don't we get together once a week or once a fortnight? The reason that that flourishes is because man can't make that. But the Holy Spirit will ignite it. I'm going to briefly turn to Romans chapter 12. I just want to read a passage from Romans chapter 12 which speaks about the same things. You know, uh, Paul's outlaid the gospel for 11 chapters. He's told us exactly what the gospel message is, the wonderful, glorious uh, gospel of God. Then he gets to chapter 12, Romans. Then he gets to chapter 12 and in, in two verses, which you could preach on for about six months, he, he, he exposes our response. But then he gets to telling us what this community should look like. You can read more about this community from verses 9 through to the end. But I want to read from verse 3. It says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. A sober judgment is realising that everybody in this room has weaknesses, everybody in this room has struggles, and everybody in this room, needs everybody else in this room. 
That's what thinking of ourselves in sober judgment is. You know, humility is not making less of yourself. Humility is making more of God. And realising, here I am, God's given me what he's given me, but without God, I can do nothing. So each one should think of himself with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. When when Paul's talking about a measure of faith, he's not saying we each get a different measure, but it's, it's all in proportion to the one measure given us in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm going to move quickly through this passage. Verse four says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Sounds a lot like what Peter's saying. Having gifts that differ according to the grace that he has given to us. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, and the one who teaches in his teaching. And if we come back to 1 Peter chapter 4, I love how Peter rounds out his part in this. He says, verse 11, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. God seems to be the most important in order that in everything. And here's, here's the banner that we all exist under. So that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. How many of us here want to live to glorify God? And I think most of us would put our hands up. You might be sitting here this morning and you might be saying, I'm wondering what my gifting is. I'm not 100% sure where I sit. I'm going to give you the easiest way you can find that out. You know, we we sometimes sit back and say, well, you know what? Uh, God hasn't quite revealed to me what my gift is. And and you know what? What I found when I was uh, playing football was uh, whenever new people came onto the team, I found that we never really knew where they fitted. Uh, They would come uh, and we would say, where do you fit? And it's interesting how every single person that comes to a football team for the first time says, I absolutely fit in the forward line. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah, right up the front there near the goals. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no, no, you and everybody else. But how we find where everybody fits is we get them out on the field. If you're sitting here this morning, you're saying, I'm not 100% sure where I fit. Get out on the field. Get in amongst it. Join the music team if you think you can sing. I've been trying to get on there for two years. <laughs> and everybody says, praise God, he hasn't got there yet. <laughs> If you've heard me sing, you've only ever heard it once. But you might be sitting here saying, I want to get involved in the kitchen team. And you start, I want to get involved working with the kids. And it's not long before you find, you know what, I'm not really suited to working with the kids, but maybe I suit the team, or maybe I'm better off at greeting people at the door. I've got a great face for radio, but not, not for television, so I don't greet people so much. But if you want to know where God's got you, you've got to get out on the field. It wasn't long before we could see where people fit and it's, hey dude, <laughs> forward line does not suit you. we put you back here. I want to make a call to everybody today because you can't get away from this in the New Testament. I'm going to be, I'm going to be flat out and honest with you. I know people here are going to be surprised when I say this. I'm not perfect. And everybody's going, hang on a second, I'll just pick my jaw up. The fact of the matter is none of us in this room are. But I want to make a call because whether we've got 500 life groups in this church, whether there is 5,000 people in this church, whether whatever happens in the future, none of it will happen unless we embrace an authentic community. It rests with us. We here as a church, we can, we've, we've got buildings, we've got programs. The answer doesn't lie in programs. The answer doesn't lie in buildings. The answer doesn't lie in the next life group starting up or, or whatever it is. There's no five-step program to this. What it is is a, is a group of people that are saying, you know what, I'm committed to following the person of Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you today whether you will make that commitment. And that could look a variety of different ways for all of us. It might look like you grabbing hold of a couple of people and saying, you know what, um, this, happened, uh, this happened a while ago, didn't it, Rob? Two guys said, why don't we just get together and pray? Now that the 10 of them get together on a Monday night, same thing happened with the women, did it not, Liz? 
And now that there's sometimes nearly 10 women on a Monday morning, and that was completely organic because people just said, you know what, I want to seek God and I want to pray. And we just come together and we just say, you know what, the Lord really shared this. this doesn't have, you don't need a leader for this. We don't need a leader for this. We just need to embrace his community. I'm going to ask the worship team if they can make their way back. We're going to sing a song as we finish. And if you need to pray, if God's put his finger on your heart and you need to pray, then uh, the leadership team's here to pray with you this morning. We have two decisions that each of us need to make. First one is, am I going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? Am I, am I willing to make that decision that from this point onwards, uh, I'm done with sin? I'm done with the ways of the world. I, I don't care what they think about me at work anymore. I don't care what my family say about me or whatever your situation is. But from this point onwards, I'm going to follow Christ. And can I tell you, there's, there's less and less people putting their hand up saying that. It's going to take guts to say that. And on the second hand, can we put our hand up and say, you know what, I, I, I want to follow Christ no matter what and I want to embrace an authentic community where I can be honest, where I can be real and where I can be open and where I can put all of my sins and all of my weaknesses and all of my struggles on the table and know this one thing, that I'm in a, a community where people love me. I was only sharing with somebody this week, I'm the most blessed pastor in Australia. I got to come to the best church. We can't find churches this good in Tasmania. There's something different in this room. Every single person that comes to the Rock Church tells me the same thing. There's something different about the people. I think there's something organic. And I think there's something that the Holy Spirit can fan into flame. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the person of Jesus Christ that started the greatest community on the globe. This pastor puts his hand up this morning and he says, I want to follow Christ. Jesus, I don't care where that looks like. I don't care what that looks like, but I'll follow you. I'll stand on your word. I'm committed to follow you. May we as a church and may we as a community embrace a community where we can be open, authentic and loving to one another. Holy Spirit, right now, I pray as you so wonderfully do, that you would do heart surgery in this room tonight, this morning. There are people in this room this morning that have struggled with sin for too long. And you don't have to. I pray, Lord, right now that you would open up hearts in this place. In your wonderful name. Amen. Let us sing.